Uh, the year has been like a roller coaster ride. The best way I can describe it is it's been, I've been like a human ping pong ball. Everything just kind of shifts quickly. You just wait for that next wave and then it just bunks you in the next direction. This semester especially has been very hard. We were definitely all burnt out, but I feel like it was a much deeper level than the end of the year burnout that we typically experience. The morale in the building has been low. I I'm devastated to say that. I know more school social workers this year that are choosing to resign, change their job, than I've ever seen. And I've been in school social work 20 years. We've had um, a lot of very unique challenges. I think we're all doing the best we can do. Um, and we have nothing to draw from. When you work with kids that struggle with anxiety and depression and some of those issues, when you can't reassure them because you don't know what's happening, you haven't been through this, it made it much more challenging. If I, as a social worker, have a hard time finding my words, how do I expect 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds to know how they feel too? I feel like the field of school social work in general, like we're, we kind of live or need to live in chaos, but this level of what's happened this year, it's super scary. We won't know for five or 10 or maybe the rest of our life, years, <laughs> how, um, how this has impacted us. Every student that I worked with, and I would also add my two sons, everyone had an increase in their struggles with mental health. Persistent anxiety. I, that has been off the charts. I, I'm an easygoing, chill kind of person, but now I'm nervous and I'm anxious and what's gonna happen next and why can't anyone tell us, you know, that kind of little level of anxiety. Everybody was worried about each other's mental health, which is really um, nice to see, but you know, obviously it's unfortunate that there's that many people that we have to worry about. Uh, I think for me, I was very worried about the isolation and the disconnect. One of our probably biggest concerns was kids that we just couldn't reach at all. We did have a lot of students that we just, we couldn't get a hold of them at home. I know these kids, especially the ones I'd known for three years and were going into their senior year. Now I've had three years of relationship with them. They're not getting on. It took a lot of time to figure that out. Initially, it was just us reaching out again via phone or, or email or Google Meet or Google Chat or you know, even text message, those things. Kids weren't reading their email. When they would get email, they would get sometimes with their classroom login information and everything, asking them to join classes, they probably would get 100 emails in a day. Our kids weren't used to operating through email. After some time and into the school year, then it became home visits. I think mom or dad felt, or grandpa, or whoever they were living with, you know, kind of helpless. In the past, you know, it would be referred to a truancy court or, you know, to, you know, child protection services under different, you know, things related to attendance. But, um, I mean, that just wasn't the case. We want to know that they're okay because we know a lot of our kids do not live in, in safe um, in home environments or even neighborhoods. And then spending that much time in those environments, we knew that that was going to be hard for them. It became very, um, daunting, I think. We just needed to try and support in any way, and that's what we did. I put like my schedule out online, on like Google, you know, so kids could sign up to see me on like a Google time slot if they wanted. At first we wanted them to have their screens on, their cameras on, and then we quickly realized that that's not something that a lot of our students were comfortable with. For many of the students I serve, they didn't have a space for privacy. You have three different kids in a two bedroom. Everyone's supposed to be on a virtual learning platform doing schoolwork. There may be a lot of chaos, other people on their phones or computers. They have their children around because I work with pregnant and parenting teen moms. I had a handful of students that would take their phone and go out to the garage or would go in a car or would be at a park. Not knowing how to reach them and knowing that the kids that I worked with had really difficult home lives, maybe abuse in the home, maybe personally being abused, um, 
physically, sexually, emotionally, um, chemical use and abuse issues. And that just made it really, really frustrating and kind of, it felt like the weight of the world was on us. Typically, if you're in a school setting, um, we may have been able to pick up on if there was any kind of abuse happening, any kind of sexual assault that might have happened. And we know with COVID, one of the things that we're hearing with research and as we've started to trickle back in person, the rates of domestic violence certainly have increased. Across the state, there's been a decrease in child protection cases that have come in. Those cases haven't decreased. The report has decreased. A child isn't going to make a report and say, yeah, this is happening to me if their perpetrator or if the, the person that harmed them is sitting two feet away from them. Children are, are being hurt and no one's helping them. I could absolutely see the difference between kids that lived in a safe and nurturing home and environment, and then there was a big gap for our, our students that um, were living in unsafe situations. If I don't have food, water, shelter, safety, there's no way I'm going to learn a new math concept or learn a new educational strategy. A lot of our students have a lot of um, a lot of really hard ships um, in their life. Whether that is homelessness, whether that is domestic violence, whether that is a loss of a parent, a divorce, a car accident, you name it. March happened and it was School is still happening. We're supposed to be doing all of these things. Our students are supposed to be doing all of these things. We haven't heard from families. There was this huge disconnect. 95% of our students receive free and reduced lunch, which in essence means that they're not getting meals if we aren't providing them. The um, ability to get what you need was scarce. Obviously, everyone was panicked. A lot of our families lost their jobs. A lot of our students had to stay home and take care of their siblings. There were districts that actually invested in having um, buses carry food to families and do drop-off. Having the St. Paul Public Schools step up and then the food shelves, the local food shelves, really stepping up um, in partnership with with the schools made a huge difference, I think, for the families across the Twin City area. We received a plethora of donations. We realized that we, we can't do this alone. We need each other. When the summer came, the three social workers were um, extended, so we would still call families once a week. It was difficult in that we're not a social service agency, but we wanted to operate as such. We had to really kind of figure out what resources were there available to us. How do we do this? Because our resources are not unlimited. Then we had the death of George Floyd. And when that happened, um, our communities that we work in, things shut down. Yeah, it's hard not to talk about the un unrest as a result of it. Our school is located directly next to the Target off of Lake Street. And as the unrest had started to happen in South Minneapolis, most of everything was either um, stolen, destroyed, or um, wet. You know, for me, my personal experience was watching it on social media live. That was really hard. I mean, I remember like screaming in my phone, like at my phone, like, that's a school, that's our school. What are you doing? Like I would, it was, I mean, I was seeing people t take stuff and set fires like as it was happening. We all just felt so helpless because all of us were watching it unfold, our students and families included. 95% of my students are minority students. And it was interesting as they told some of their stories of trauma and some of their stories of being on the lines at the protests or having their neighbor, neighborhood burn. I knew I needed to stop the way I was moving and slow myself down and just be present for however long a student wanted to see me that day. You know, we had a lot of students who were really angry, um, really confused, fearful. We would have loved to have had conversations with our students and held restorative circles with them and that just wasn't obviously possible. It was just fascinating to me how they were bursting and almost seemed like some of them had grown up by about five years since the last time I'd seen them. They, they just were 
different people from the people I had known the year before. I know one of the things that inspires me each and every day is the resilience that the students and the families have. It's, it's really important to note that resilience and my job as a school social worker is also to build that resilience. We decided to have a donation drive and it was insane. We didn't even think about this, but we had community members who were coming asking for food, you know, like, oh, I live down there, you know, and we have a Cub Foods right there, we had a Target right there, we had an Aldi, like all of that was shut down. People were asking like, can we give food to community members if they don't have students in our district? I was like, of course. I can't forget to, to honor just the, just the generosity of people during this time and really coming together to support one another. It was beautiful. It was probably one of the highlights of my career so far. That day was just, it was perfect and our students came and helped out. They were interviewed on the news and they just were so proud and um, it was just it was just a really beautiful moment that was um, still lasting, like the, the effects of that are still lasting today.